whale. Welcome, everyone. My name is Rochelle, and I am powerless over drugs and alcohol and codependency. But tonight, I choose recovery. Hello, hello, hello. So as you heard, tonight is Ask a Basket. Now, if you're new here, you might be wondering, what the heck are these people doing when they say Ask a Basket and there's going to be experts up here? Let me just um, clue you in on something. We are not experts. We just happen to be people that have been working this program for a little while. And so we have a little bit of experience. And we're willing to stand up here and take the fire and randomly ask, answer your questions. And so why don't you give all of our volunteers a hand for being willing. <laughs> and Tech Booth, please bear with us. I don't know who has yep, what mics yep, yep. and we'll all figure it out, but we will all work together. And so um, that's, that's what we're here for. We're, we're just going to answer the questions that you guys um, set in. And so I'm going to start off with asking everyone to introduce themselves and give their sobriety date. And so we'll start this way. Heidi, how got a person worth, and my recovery date is July 22nd, 2020. Hi, Heidi. Hi, I'm Ashley. Again, I choose recovery from drugs and alcohol. My sobriety date is June 18, 2017. Hi, Ashley. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'm a Christian, and I choose recovery, and my um, sobriety date is May 25th of 2017. Hi, Mike. Uh, I'm a grateful Christian recovering from crack cocaine addiction, lots of immoral behavior. Tonight, I choose recovery. My name is John, and my sobriety date is March 27, 2021. Hi, John. Hi, John. And again, my name is Rochelle, and I'm in recovery from drugs and alcohol and codependency. My sobriety date is January 15, 2012. Hi, Rochelle. Hi. Okay, so Phil. She's it's trying to Rochelle. Oh. Not Rochelle. It's a name. My fault. <laughs> so, guys, so I was going through these questions, and there was lots of really, really, really good questions. And so um, I, what I did is I just went through and I sorted them because, you know, what, what I like to do is look to see if there's patterns, if there's a lot of people in here that have the same type of questions because there's so many questions that we're not going to get to them all tonight. But if there's a common thread, I do want to make sure that we can, you know, address that because it's, it's a common question. And so um, these people have no idea what I'm going to ask them. And we try, to, <laughs> we try to have fun up here, and nobody's nervous at all. Like, everyone is, everyone is super excited about this and, like, you know, peaceful. And they, they know all the answers because they're, like, professionals and all. Yeah. So take every word that they say to heart because, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Guys, give us some grace. We're all human beings. We're up here. We're going to have some fun together. And this is how we do recovery, is we do recovery together, each and of us just sharing our own experience and trying to help someone else along. And so one of the biggest questions, um, actually, it was the biggest topic that we had today, um, happens to be about sponsorship. And so there were nine questions that had to do with sponsorship which means there's a lot of people in here searching that are hungry and that want to know what that next step is. And a common theme should, it seems to be um, about like, how do I get a sponsor? And um, you know, how do I share stuff with a sponsor that I don't want to tell anybody? Um, and, and so um, Heidi, I'm going to start with you because you're right next to me and you may know a thing or two about yeah, yeah. sponsorship. And so can you share with us, like, how did you get a sponsor? What does your sponsor do for you? You know, how do, how do you use your sponsor? And what do you do if you don't want to tell your sponsor something? Well, um, first off, I tell my sponsor everything. So if you tell me something, my sponsor already knows it. Um, Hold the mic up. But I got a sponsor just because God gave her to me. But I know that um, through that, it's that willingness to want to reach out to that other person that you don't want to stay as sick as you are. And there's somebody out there for you, I promise. Um, but in that moment, you know, your sponsor is somebody that you trust, that you get along with, you laugh and joke. And no, they're not your, your best friend, your therapist, none of that. But they are somebody that you should trust and have that trust with. So. How did you build that trust? Um, I really didn't have a choice. I was at my last rope, and this lady um, kind of just took me under her wing and was like, hey, I love you. Come on, let's keep going. So she took me to my first sober house and uh, left me there on a blackout for a week. 
I don't yeah. know who her sponsor is. Yeah. <laughs> that may or may not have been myself. Okay, so the other question, second in line, has to do with steps. Like people want to know like really what's the benefit of working the steps? Do these steps actually help me in all areas of my life or is it just going to keep me from picking up drugs and alcohol? Do I have to do them? Is that question for me? Yes, <laughs> you're next. I did, last time we didn't go in order, so. Yeah. Um, so the 12 steps, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen to you when you work the 12 steps. It's really one of those those God things. But I do know that each time I worked one of the steps in order, all 12 of them, that I found a little bit more freedom. Yeah. And honestly, by doing that, it made me feel good about myself because I knew I was working my recovery program. I knew that I was doing what someone asked, suggested of me to do. And that helped me it be a little bit easier to stay sober that day. And when life comes up, because we know it will, for some reason it's a little bit easier to walk through it as I continue to find freedom. Now, for me, I've learned that I've had, I have to work the 12 steps not only, you know, the first time I went through them, but with sponsees and then even go through them again on my own because God reveals more stuff that I'm still suffering from. Mm. <laughs> But it's in his time, you know, he only lets us handle um, what we're ready for in that moment. Um, but I definitely recommend the 12 steps. Um, for me personally, it's a lot simpler than opening up a Bible and trying to get recovery by reading Genesis, <laughs> <laughs> which is very hard. Don't do that. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Okay, so we're, we're going to keep one. going in order because it's, it's working out pretty good this way. So the next one, people want to know about, like, meetings. Like, what type of meetings to go to? Do you really have to attend meetings? Like, are they that important? What do you get out of them? Like, what's it? Well, for me, when I first came back around, um, I did what they said. I went to 90 meetings in 90 days. I probably went to more than that. But um, for me, it was, like, getting involved and you know, and, and they're also, um, it was going here to hear these people with time share their experience with me in the beginning. So I didn't feel alone anymore. Um, and I could relate, um, especially when I, when I came back this time because I had relapsed. And then to hear everybody share about how they relapsed, it was more comfortable. But, you know, my sponsor um, suggested I'd go to, like, you know, a meeting every day and then pick a home group that I felt comfortable with which I went back to my, my old home group because they, you know, they, I felt love in that room. I didn't feel like, at first I thought I, I had to switch fellowships and move to Naples, but yet when I came back in these meetings, you know, I felt the love. And then also, you know, every once in a while you hear something like, wow, that was really good, you know. And then, you know, nowadays I go to a meeting just to stay involved I'm still going to hear that nugget and to help others, really. You know, hopefully a newcomer comes in and, and I raise my hand and I want to be a sponsor because I need new people <laughs> more than they think that, you know, more than almost they need me. So. Just a, just a clue, if you're new here and you see someone answer something and the rest of us chuckle around them, it's because we know we've, we, we, we did that same type of thing. Like we were ready to go to a different city because we wanted to hide, you know. And so a lot of times you hear these experiences and the reason we do these ask it baskets is like we're not terminally unique. If there's something we've thought, somebody else has thought it. If there's some way around trying to do this program, someone else has tried to figure out that way around too. So that's my thing, too, is when I go to meetings, I learn from their experience. I don't got to make their mistakes. And so hopefully you're picking up on those, too. Okay, so service. And it just so happened to work out this way. But, John, tell us a little bit about service. Like, do I have to do service work? Like, <coughs> Well, for, for me, um, I'm, I go by the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program that was set up years ago. And the program has this uh, as a... Uh, a, a insignia, whatever you call it, a label, whatever it is, it's a triangle with a circle around it. And one side of that triangle is recovery, that's the 12 steps. One side is unity, what we do together outside of the fellowship. And the other side is service work. 
And so all three of the components I have to take part in, now this is for me, or else, because if I don't do one of those besides the triangle, the triangle collapses, mm -hmm. and I start to go backwards. Uh, for me, I am a, a extremely, in, I'm so scared of going back to where I was that I'm gonna do everything that was suggested of me uh, because of how bad it got. And I don't want to experience that pain anymore. So that pain got so great that I, the pain of change wasn't as bad as the pain of remaining the same. So I do a lot of service work, and service work is extremely important to me. It's one of the five essentials of our program here. Uh, what do we say about service? Do it. Uh, that's my answer. Okay. Well, now we're just randomly going to go with these questions in order. So, like, yeah, there we go. Easy. <laughs> no, I just mean the easy one. Okay. So, is it normal to think about relapsing? Oh, yeah. Um, like all the time, you know, my best thinking got me here, and my best thinking is that. Um, so I know that, like, with relapse, that it is part of people's story. You know, it happens. It's, you know, it's it's there. Um, but it, it is in your brain. I mean, we're hardwired to think that way. That's how we cope with life, and when you take that away, it's, you know, trust your Jesus. It's kind of scary. So what do you do when you think about relapsing? I uh, call my sponsor, call accountability people. I really do try to read the big book. So... I mean, uh, for me, it's talking about it, um, getting it outside of my head, because if I leave it in my head, it just sits there and spins. But mm -hmm. normally, if I'm able to get with somebody else, sit down and call somebody else in the house and be like, hey, you know, this is what's going on in my brain, we're able to get it out, we can laugh about it, because we all have those thoughts. So I just realized that people are just as messed up as I am. So, so by show of hands here, who else in recovery has thought about picking up again? Okay, so if that's you here right now and you think something's wrong with you, you're not working your program right, and you missed something because you had a thought about using, keep coming back, you're in the right place, and just don't pick up. Don't get pick up because the longer we wait, you know, the longer we make it, the less thoughts we have. And just keep coming. Okay, so do I really need to surrender to go forward? Help us out on yeah. your opinion with that. Honestly, for me personally, before I, this last time, <laughs> of actually surrendering, the first time really surrendering, I would try to do it, I would try to figure it out. I would try to, you know, go to the doctor. The doctor can give me symptoms, help me with all the symptoms of all the craziness. You know, I would try to go to a sober living house, but if the house mom was gone for a weekend, that was an opportunity. I everything was an opportunity, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. No matter how hard I tried to control the situation and and fix it, I couldn't until I finally surrendered and, and said, like, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to live sober. That's when I was able to invite God in and people. God using to, to help me, you know, figure out how to walk through the bad stuff and the good stuff and the boring stuff. Because that the boring stuff is what was really <laughs> scary, scary, to be honest, for me. Thank you. So I'm going to answer this one. It says, what must you do to keep your sobriety? Don't pick up. <laughs> like, seriously, sometimes it might be one minute at a time. It might be white-knuckling it. But if you want to keep your sobriety from drugs and alcohol, just don't pick up. There's other things that you can do and apply this program, but the number one rule, don't pick up no matter what. That's my opinion on that. Okay, so even if you stayed sober for a little while, when would be a good time to restart your steps? When you get restless, irritable, and discontented. Mm. Um, some people do steps every year with their sponsor. I mean, I listen to a lot of speaker tapes, and they, they do their steps once a year. Some wait every five years. Then I've had some old-timers tell me, if you keep up, well, he says, the maintenance, I say it's a spiritual growth of 10, 11, and 12, and keep doing that every day. Um, <laughs> sorry about this. I had to turn my phone off. That's annoying. <laughs> Um, it's my phone. I feel embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Step 10. What can I do to make that up for you guys? Um, it's a joke. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, for me, I, I would say if I get really restless, irritable, and discontent, I would probably ask my sponsor to run me through the steps again, so. I mean. Good stuff. <laughs> Keep coming back. Bye, Mike. He's a runner. So, how long should you wait to do a fifth step? Like, how do you know if you're actually ready for it? Well, in my experience, uh, once I completed my fourth step, and as the book, big book tells to go back over to see if I've omitted anything, uh, then I, and, and, and right before step four, it says we launch into a course of vigorous action. So the fifth step comes right after the fourth step. So I'm going to, when I sponsor another man, we do it right, we do that right away. And um, that's my answer to that, right away. That's what I did. Well, there's no reason to wait in between four and five, in my opinion. Yes. Everybody sitting like on that? that stuff. From, from my experience, you I take like inventory that. of that. And sitting on that inventory is not the best thing to look at because you're taking a look at all that junk that's in your closet. And, you know, you want release and freedom from that junk. And so from my experience, the quicker. It's like how, how quick do you want to get better? Right. Like How long do you want to stay sick? Yeah. Do you want to get well? Okay, so it's the next one, though. Yeah, I'm so excited. So excited. You can't lie to me. You I can tell by looking at her. <laughs> okay, so what, what do you do when the world around you is going to crap and you are fighting the run everything? You're, you're fighting from the feeling to run everything. I can't say what they, they put, but I'm sure you've got the idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I can't make it up, though. Um, yeah, no, I really appreciate that because um, I have that feeling a lot. You know, everything will be going wrong in my world, and I get a case of the epics or whatever. And I, you know, call my sponsor. I'm like, I'm rolling it up. I'm headed out of town. And then we play the tape all the way through. And no matter how bad it is, there's, you know, a way out of it. You know, in this moment, you're here for a reason, and you've gotten here for a reason. You, the struggle seems big, but your God is bigger. And it's, it's one of those places that I've been in many times, and I mean, it's hard. But feelings, and whose feelings are they? They're ours, so we just have to get over it. I'd turn to a TikTok channel and tell TikTok all about it. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know you'll have a lot more subscribers tonight. <laughs> it's really a hoot. Um, so, how do I know if I'm where I'm supposed to be, can I tell if I'm where God wants me to be? <laughs> I, uh, some of these things, guys, we, we can only share our own experience. We don't have all the answers. Um, but how would you, if you were questioning that? I just want to let you know, you guys are all where you're supposed to be right now in this moment. Mm -hmm. Every single one of you. We had a nice home-cooked meal. It was hot. It was a little spicy, a little kickback, but but it, it, it was a hot meal. And whether you came right off the streets or whether you have a home to go to, sometimes that's the only home-cooked meal you might get, a hot meal. So besides the food. Mm -hmm. There's other reasons that you're right where you're supposed to be besides yeah. the food. For me, I always try to, sometimes it's hard to know if you're in God's will, but as long as you're doing something could conducive, something that's going to help you grow in your recovery, in your, your walk with life, then you're, you're where God wants you to be. Like, and that's how I base it on. Like, we can sit here all day and try to pinpoint exactly what God has for us, but we can only take it one step at a time and we can only be where our feet are right in that mm -hmm. moment. So as long as we're in a safe, good place, I'm pretty sure that's where God wants us to be. Yeah. So. Good stuff. Good stuff. So it's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> when did you have your spiritual awakening? <laughs> can't mess this one up. It's your experience, they asked. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, you can't mess that one up. It started like right after I had my fifth step, I went home. Um, there were some lot of things that 
I didn't write down on the fourth step. Um, and I said, this time I'm going to do it. I'm going to write it all down. And I went to this park, and I cried with my sponsor on them last things. And I went home. But I didn't realize I really had a spiritual awakening until a guy told me after the meeting. And when I looked at him, I said, man, I used to come to these meetings, and I can't wait to get out of here. And, he go, and now I'm one of the last ones sitting here talking to you about recovery. And he goes, and he's like, dude, you had a spiritual awakening. Your life has changed, hasn't it? I went, yeah, everything's different now. Everything changed. I can't really pinpoint when it happened. I know the man told me that after back to the beginnings meeting in, in, at the other Grace campus. But I imagine it started happening right after the fifth step. You know, going home and just praying to God. You know, I had nothing. I, 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 when I came back this time, talk about surrender, it was more like abandoned. I didn't care what. I could get out of life no more. I just wanted this to stop. I was going to do anything anybody wanted me to do. I didn't care about my job. I didn't care about this. I didn't care about that. I was so desperate. This has to stop. And then all of a sudden, I had a spiritual awakening. And where God's got me today is just unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, John, what does someone get out of recovery? Mm-hmm. Where does someone get out? What does someone get out of recovery? Yeah, I, I'd be here all night if I were to answer what I got out of recovery. I get a life second to none. I get a design for living that is guaranteed to work. It tells me, gives me clear-cut directions on what to do with what I suffer with all through the book. And in the first part, it says, uh, besides, we think our way of living has its advantages for all. That means if I'm upright and breathing, it doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol. Could be codependency, could be anger, could be gambling, could be anything that we suffer with. And I get freedom. I get closer to God. The simple purpose of the 12 steps is to show each other what may be done to enlist the aid of, of God and to rely all I do on God. And do I do that perfect? No, absolutely not. But I work at it every day. And my life has changed, like Mike said, in oh so many ways. So it's just, I get... Count this. No, there's no the the, the it's in it's in it's in inf, not infamous. I forget the words, but it, it just keeps going and going and going. What the gifts I'm beginning to receive are greater than I could have ever imagined. Okay, thank you. Well, we have a couple left, and so I'm going to skip over to back to Mike because I have a question for you. Um, what if I have something on my fourth step? that I can't trust anyone with. I struggled with that for years. Some people say it kept me out there. I, I don't know. Um, I get, the pain was so great, I just, um, what was the exact question? No, I want to make sure I answer this right. Like, what if I have something on my fourth step that I can't trust anyone with? That's a hard one because eventually I trusted somebody. It, it got brought, I was just abandoned to myself, with God and another human being at that park, and my sponsor got it out of me. i got to tell you something, guys. I went to a, a Catholic church where I grew up, and I thought that I didn't need all this. And I'm going to go confess my sins right after I got out of re rehab. And do you know what I did? I lied. I lied. I lied. I don't know why I lied. I was in a box. I mean, God was right there, right? And he knew everything about me, but I lied guy who didn't even see my face. So I guess it took the really hardcore beginning of the steps to just give it all to bring that out of me. And I know it changed my life. So I really, I really don't know if that's a good answer. I think it is. I it's your experience. I think that, that was, yes, yes. There may have been a reason why I asked him that because he, like myself, had, a, had something that we didn't want to share and mine about took me back out. And it's not, you know, today I am so grateful you know, for the willingness to just share it because I was the only one staying sick. My secret didn't, it didn't harm anyone else. It didn't harm anyone else in the rooms. It didn't harm my sponsor or anyone. It was me. I was the one suffering with that. Okay, so the other question, I'm trying to figure out which one I'm going to, th this is a loaded question too, guys. So, and I have experience with this, this as well, so I was wondering if I was, like, going to actually answer it myself or throw it at you guys. 
Ashley. She's scared now. So the other question people want to know a lot about is emotions. I've got, what do I do when I have an emotional imbalance? What do I do when I'm a year clean and my emotions are still all over the place? What do I do when I'm feeling the emotions that I don't enjoy it? What do I do with all the emotions from my past relationships? What is your experience with emotions? So my experience is for, I think, the first five years of my recovery, I thought I was, you know, working a program and very vulnerable. I thought I was a very vulnerable person. Um, and then I started working the 12 steps most recently, and my sponsor told me that I lack vulnerability. And I, for the first time, got a therapist and started meeting on a regular basis to learn how to express my emotions, whether they're good, bad, ugly, um, overreacting, underreacting, which was how I was most of the time. Um, I struggled with expressing my emotions because I was worried about the person in front of me's emotions and how they were going to react. And I always played that tape out. So I definitely encourage, like, we need all the help we can get, you know? And it just, it comes down to that. And there's so many resources, even in the mental health community, that I just honestly ask. Like, that's how I've gotten every, anything I've wanted or needed help with in recovery, I've just asked somebody else and God put that person in my path to help me walk through that and, 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 and get help. Um, but also, I just this is just a nugget that I've always kept with me. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Mm. And sometimes that's how I get through my days. Sometimes I take a nap and start my day over. Mm. That is a great one. Let's give everybody a hand here. That is some good stuff. I can say for me, you know, it, it, I found myself, you know, in, in different places, but myself too is, you know, with a therapist because like emotions are rough. And I, you know, I, I think most of us in here weren't raised by some, you know, raised by a family that taught us how to handle them. You know, that's something we start learning from the time we're born. We start learning emotions, and if we're not taught how to handle and how to process things, like, the world's not going to teach us. And, and so it is a great idea to continue to seek more additional help with those things. And so, again, I want to thank everyone. That is it. And we actually made it through the majority of the questions. Again, if your question didn't get answered, it probably was because it had to do with the topic of what I bundled it with with another question. If I didn't get to it, if I missed it, I do apologize. We will be hanging around um, here afterwards, and we can answer any questions that you have. Um, I did have one more down here, and I don't remember. Okay, so back to the, the question about God's will. I had two people ask, how do I know that there's really a God? And... I can't tell you how to know, but I can tell me how I know. I couldn't go a day without picking up a drink or a drug. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror with any type of integrity or decency. I, I, I could not, I had no idea what to do with these children that I was raising. Um, I had no idea. I'd gotten myself into such messes that there was no way that I could, that, that there was a solution that I was getting out of. And I'm sitting here today, and I haven't put a drink or a drug in my, in, in, in my body. And I can handle situations that used to baffle me. And I have a community of people that surround me that love me. I am sitting here right now in this moment, not because I had my life together and I made all the right choices. I'm sitting here right now because there was a God that loved me and wanted to give me a life greater than I could have imagined. 
and I finally got submitted to beaten down by this world enough that I surrendered and turned to him. And he transformed my life. And that's my experience. And I believe that for everyone in here. Like, we are not sitting in here by mistake. We're not sitting in here because our lives were perfect. And, and, and there is forgiveness for all that we have walked through, for all that we have suffered, for all the pain that we have caused for other people. And, and I know that if you have a mustard seed of faith, a mustard seed, an itty-bitty tiny bit of faith, that there is a God, he will meet you right there. And he will begin transforming your life because that's all it takes. It all, all it takes is the willingness to be willing to believe that there's something bigger than you and that, and that he has a plan and a purpose. And you might not know what it is and you don't have to know the big plan. But if you're struggling with that question tonight and you're wondering if there is a God, I invite you to this altar and ask him. Because if you seek him, you will find him. That's been my experience. When you seek him wholeheartedly, he will show up. And so if you want to know if there's a God, ask him. He can handle all of our questions. And he loves you. That's why you're here. Let's stand for prayer. God, we don't have all the answers. Half the time, we don't even know what we're doing with our lives. Lord, we're here today because you have a plan and a purpose, that you have a life greater than we could have ever could have imagined in store for us. So, Lord, we come here today to meet you here and to surrender all that we struggle with, to turn things over to you, to allow you to work in our lives. And so, Lord, meet us here tonight in this place and fill us with your presence so we can go out there and carry the message to others that transformation is possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This altar is going to be open. If you'd like someone to pray with you, please raise your hand. We will have prayer people up here to pray with you. Mm -hmm.